Pastor Aaron's fault. <laughs> when in doubt, blame the youth pastor. <laughs> You're usually right about. So, friends, another beautiful Sabbath. And today we're talking about God's kingdom. And I don't know if you're like me, but growing up, the kingdom was talked about in so many different ways. That at some point, if somebody asked me, what's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom is now, and the kingdom is near, and the kingdom belongs to little children, and seek you first the kingdom of God, I would probably be pretty stumped, right? If you're like, I think it means the same thing, but now I'm not quite so sure. And even if you look into the parables, right, the, um, the kingdom of heaven is like the 10 versions, and you're just like, oh, okay, well, you know what, leave it to the theologians. They'll figure it out for us. But I want to remind you that although it doesn't sound like the same kingdom, it really is. God's kingdom, once established, established, is meant to reign forever and ever. And it's not a kingdom that disappeared for some time. It's not a kingdom that is t taken over by evil, but it's always God's kingdom. It always has been, it always will be. So we're talking about one full kingdom. But in order for us to maybe understand some of the differences in how it's described, give me permission to divide it into four parts. The kingdom of God can maybe be looked at in four parts. Part one, the original kingdom of God. So everyone is living face to face in this harmony within this perfect community and the love of Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, right? We're all in this perfect uh, communion with him. And then there's the Garden of Eden and we're all in just this perfect dominion of God. Part two is the kingdom of God after sin. So it's the story of how we drove our world into its most corrupt and evil state. And in a lot of the Old Testament, you know, it is, is kind of in this shadow quite a bit. And you hear a lot of the prophets saying things like the kingdom is near. So this is kind of like a broad stroke, part two of the kingdom of God. And then we come to part three, the kingdom of God when Jesus enters into the picture. So now the kingdom of God is reintroduced to us. Jesus is speaking about God's original kingdom. However, he's saying how we can experience that kingdom now. In essence, it's saying, hey, listen, the kingdom of God is always, forever, will be, has been, but let me show you, let me, because I just came from there, and, and I know it perfectly, like by memory, like let me show you what that looks like. And he tells us to seek God's kingdom and experience a different type of relationship with him and with the world, which is his kingdom. So we're starting to get a sense that like Jesus is bringing back the original definition of the kingdom. Then we have part four, which is where most of us tend to kind of separate the kingdom in a way, and, and that's where it's the ultimate manifestation of God's kingdom. So after Jesus comes again for the second time and he restores the world back to its original design, and now we're once again living in perfect harmony face to face with the love of our lives, Jesus Christ. And so one big, kind of has different faces to it, but one kingdom of God. And where I want to focus on is like, all right, so like past, present, future, like what, how does this apply to me? And if you're still a little confused about where these kind of four parts play in together, I have a video from the Bible Project that kind of summarizes parts one, two, and three. And part three is where we're gonna focus on. Let's see the video.
wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now, Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills, we see a messenger, and he's running towards the city. He's running, and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? That despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. Yeah, so when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, powerful, successful kingdom. It needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside-down kingdom. Now, Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high-ranking Roman officer, and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right, but for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. And so how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king, that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. So in the middle of our lives, when we turn on the TV or iPads or anything and just the crises, crises that exist around us make us 
wonder, are there still good news? And what I want you to do is come with me. We're going to go back in time. We're going to go to that part three of the kingdom. During this moment in Jesus' ministry, When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. And if you can imagine yourself sitting quietly at his feet, this is what you will hear. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God in his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you'll find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get, in, get your inside world, your mind and your heart, put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to, the, to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they're uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even, for though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you're in good company because my prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Words by Eugene Peterson in the message translation. What an upside down kingdom. As the editor, retired editor of the Adventist Review, William Johnson tells us, these are not words spoken to the general people. They're not for the general masses because they just don't make a lot of sense when we try to apply them with running a country or, or things like that. But rather, he says, these are words spoken to each person who confesses Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He goes on to say, wherever a person permits Jesus to be the Lord of his or her life, the kingdom of God is there. I mean, friends, this is so mind-blowing because these are words for people like you and me, right? I mean, raise your hand if you're like, I feel like the scum of the earth sometimes. I feel like I'm at the end of my rope. I feel like I have nothing good left in me. You don't have to raise your hands, but I will. And somehow this upside down kingdom is not asking for the strongest of warriors like the Jewish people wanted to defeat the Romans and once again be established at the top like they used to be before they denounced God. No, Jesus didn't come saying, hey, I know you're a police officer. You look pretty buff. You carry a gun sometimes. Don't tell us if you're carrying one now. But you're going to be part of this kingdom to defeat 
the Romans. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, Chuck, you've told us about your brokenness. You're part of my kingdom. This is specifically directed at people like you and me. So when we hear these beatitudes, I want us to now bring this into a deeper context. Maybe you picture God's kingdom as, you know, like warriors going off and to battle, and maybe you picture God's kingdom as this gentle embrace of a child. Wherever you are with your picture of the kingdom, I want to bring it home and put it into perspective. So I've asked a couple of volunteers to help me. Skyla, Noah, come on up. Jesus, come through. And Skyla is going to represent all of us. Now, we are given this invitation to partake of God's kingdom. And when we come, as we are, broken, this is usually what we carry, sometimes more. So sometimes you'll find um, a helmet. Maybe we carry our own opinions, our own ideas, our own ideas of justice, of judgment. Maybe you're carrying a shield, which is maybe like apathy, maybe like this, I, I just don't really care that much attitude. Like I care some, but like it's not that much. Maybe you carry these words or these actions that, that hurt people. Maybe you're carrying an identity that's been edited to hide our real one. Maybe you're carrying with you a couple of tools that you've acquired on through life. Maybe that um, unkind acts, words that hurt or shame others. Maybe you're carrying like this distraction of a virtual reality, however you want to perceive it. That just says, you know, if, if I can't see what's wrong with the world, maybe it's just not there. Let me just stay in this really beautiful place. Maybe if I close my eyes. Maybe you're aware of some of the things that are happening, but you're carrying in your bag this pass that says somebody else can take care of it. Pastor Aaron, you do good things. You take care of it. Maybe you're carrying these things. So when you are asked to fight in God's kingdom, Stand over here beside the table. Noah, come forth. Skyla, you stay there. Maybe the world is going to throw at you hate or hurt. Maybe it's going to throw its anger at you. Maybe it has rude words or symbols that you can guess what that means. Guess what we're going to use to fight back? What, what else do we have? A false identity, our own ideas of judgment, apathy. We're going to fight back with this. You know, this is what we look like. So when Jesus came and says, mm -mm, we don't fight evil like that. We, as part of my kingdom, I have something different for you. William Johnson writes in his book, Authentic Adventism, that the kingdom of God asks us to fight this, oh, the world in this way, and he wrote the Beatitudes to show a contrast of what the kingdom here on earth asks you to do, and what they think is the correct thing to do, and what the kingdom of God says to do instead. So, the first one says, uh, blessed are the strong, the proud, and the self-sufficient. The world is going to tell you this is valuable, so blessed are you who hit these bullet points. But Jesus said, blessed are the vulnerable, the weak, for God can be their all-sufficiency. 
the earth says, blessed are those who are cool. But Jesus says, blessed are those who are broken because they are ready miss my thing they are ready for Jesus to rule their lives and so he gives us a heart of flesh we're sensitive to the world the earth says blessed are the assertive Yes, put yourself in, that, in a good place. But the, 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 Jesus says, blessed are those who know themselves, who are content with just who they are. So he gives us words of life. The world says, blessed are those who acquire the greatest number of toys. But Jesus says, blessed are those who desire Jesus more than anyone or anything. And this is the invitation into God's easy yoke. He says, blessed, the earth says, blessed are the tough. But Jesus says something different. Jesus says, blessed are the kind, the gentle, the thoughtful. The world says, blessed are those who look and act smart. But Jesus says, Blessed are those whose inner life isn't in tension with the front they show to others. And they can proudly say, I am who God says I am. The world says, blessed are the forceful, the winners. The I just don't care crowd, leave it to somebody else. I'm going to get on top. But Jesus says, Blessed are those who know that God is Father of all and we are one family. The world says, blessed are the people up on top who get by with lying and cheating. But Jesus says, blessed are those who love God and put him first, no matter the cost. You guys get that? Put it on a comb. Children's ministry for you. So now, now when the world is approaching and you're going into the world that God has called you into, go out, right, the commission, go out and make disciples and you're confronted with people who are continuing to throw ugliness at you, throw that ugliness, and it's throwing sin our way. I want you to know that we are kingdom dwellers who only carry good news because this is an upside down kingdom. And we say, you who are broken, you are part of God's family. You belong. This is the radical ethic of God's love. And he says, that's the kingdom I want you to live right now. And this is what happens. 
So now we have the tools. We say, hey, I have a heart of flesh. I have an identity that I can show you how to get there. I have kind acts. I have words of life. Throw anything at me. We are ready. But that only comes because Skyla has chosen to dwell permanently make a dwelling under the easy yoke of Jesus. Because friends, tell me, if it's easy to say something kind when somebody's yelling at you, tell me if it's easy to turn the other cheek when somebody shows an injustice to you. Tell me that it's easy to not want to be distracted when there's so much ugliness happening in this world. So much social injustice. It's so hard. But under the easy yoke of Jesus, what's really cool about this, and a lot of the kids that have been at the academies know exactly what I'm talking about, is that when you're confronted with something really difficult, you don't have to say, oh my goodness, which one am I gonna use? What's gonna happen? You look to Jesus. And Jesus says, watch me, stay close by, because we're gonna love on this person who is so hard to love. Or we're gonna do that really uncomfortable thing, we're gonna go do that, and it's really, really hard. Watch me, keep your eyes on me. I might tell you to help me out and you know, kind of give you a little tool to you know, partner up with me. But it's Jesus who's doing the work and you're stuck with Jesus and Jesus is going to give you the identity, he's gonna give you the heart of flesh, he's gonna give you the kindness, he's gonna give you the joy, but Jesus is the good news. You can't go anywhere without that. So thank you guys so much, you guys can exit. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta King were in the midst of a lot of ugliness in their world as they were fighting segregation, they were fighting racism and hatred and so much that was, we were struggling with on all sides of the line. And they say these things, Coretta King says, and so we come full circle the struggle to eliminate the world's evils, evils so flagrant and self-evident that they glare at us from every ghetto, street, and rural hovel, can only occur through a profound internal struggle. By reaching into and beyond ourselves and tapping the transcendent moral ethic of love, we shall overcome these evils love truth, and the courage to do what is right should be our guideposts on this lifelong journey. Martin Luther King beautifully put it in these words, only through an inner spiritual transformation do we gain the strength to fight vigorously the evils of the world in a humble and loving spirit. So we have this picture now, you and me, the upside down kingdom, the bold kingdom dwellers. Somebody who has partnered up with Jesus to take the message, the best news, and he enables us to heal and connect all other broken humans to this Jesus so that they too can have this authentic connection and live under his easy yoke. We live in the kingdom now. This is, a, this is and can be a beautiful place to live in, not a miserable, problem-laden place. We have the good news, and that joy is what should radiate all of our hearts and everything that Jesus can do for you as you face the ugliness of this world. William Johnson says, the day will come, the day of Jesus' second coming, when the master will reign as king of kings and lord of lords, then the kingdom of God will appear in its ultimate manifestation. But we do not have to wait until then to find the kingdom of God. The kingdom is already here. The kingdom is now. So we have so much to look forward to we have so much to look forward to today, this kingdom here on earth. 
And if you're still kind of grappling with, you know, yeah, I know this is not the best place and I'm actually looking more forward to heaven. Me too. But you're not alone in that, in, in that weird space. Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians, he says this. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So family, hold fast to our call while we are here on earth. Hold fast to the hope. So look forward to the day when we can live in that part four version of God's kingdom, a place where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, and we can live face to face with the love of our lives, Jesus Christ. Be blessed. Let us pray. Jesus, we don't want to live on this earth without you. When we hear your words, there is nothing more encouraging to know that today we can live in this kingdom, proclaiming good news, spreading your love, and the promise of living under your yoke. And God, there is nothing more beautiful than the desire to want to touch your hands and look into your eyes and give you a big, tight hug. And we know this day is coming when we will be united forever. Thank you for giving us something to look forward to today and something to hold on to for tomorrow. I pray this in your name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. You may be seated.